And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the mad genius behind Big Eyes Small Mouth, as well as Ab as well as Absolute Power, oh, formerly known as um, Silver Age Sentinels 2.0, and the Be and the Bezum mini game trilogy, which have all been covered in one form or another here on the temple. We have the one we have the mastermind of Discami Publishing now entering his new his newest expansion to Bezum, that being Multiverse along with a few other things which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only Mark McKinnon. How you doing today, man? That's great. Thank you very much for having me on again. Thank you for coming on. So it's, it's always a treat have, having you on. It's, and um it's it's nice to know it's nice to know that I'm not suffering alone when it comes to the surprise snowfall. <laughs> yeah, and it's getting that time of year. Yeah. Uh well, I've al I've always had the approach of if it if it's not winter, you're pre it's it's prepare for winter. The whole winter is coming from Game of Thrones. That's not a that's not a <laughs> that's not a tagline. That's a fact of life. That's true. That's true. So the last time the last time that I had discussed um, Besom on this channel was or was if I want to get real technical around the time of extras. Um, yeah, that would have been two years ago. I know. I know that we had also. I know that um, the trilogy and and stu and um, stuff li and stuff like absolute power still use the tristat system, but that's still not Besom. So as pedantic as it is, I'm, I can't count it. <laughs> no, no, of course not. And the advantage of having the one system does allow expansions and supplements for one game to be used in the other, and that compatibility is important. But certainly, yeah, it's been two years since we've been in that Bessem sandbox, and it's really nice to get back with this Kickstarter. Yeah. Now, the concept of the of the multiverse, I do recall. I do recall this kind of thing um, being dipped into back in the days of third edition. Is Multiverse is essentially a updated version of that, or is it a similar but different affair? Yeah, no, very, very similar. That's that's really where it started. Was whenever we went from second edition, uh, which of course was a just a system at that mm -hmm. point, and then we released different expansions that kind of gave setting context, but there was no official setting. And when we did Bessem Third Edition, I wanted to have the Bessem Multiverse as the official setting uh, for Bessem. And given that Bessem was designed to be a universal multi-genre game, it made sense to have a setting that was also multi-genre. And and the only way to do it was through a multiverse mm -hmm. so uh, although it never went anywhere because third edition was just a single core book whenever we redid and came out with fourth edition we included the multiverse concept backed in the core book knowing that we were going to expand upon it in the expansion something that we had planned for third edition but when you know the previous company didn't exist uh, in time to do it but now we're finally getting to it and it's great to to finally see and write about what the multiverse is and and uh, everything that covers all the different genres the different prime worlds the secondary worlds and so it's wonderful to be to be back there yeah now for me personally my introduction to the concept of doing multiverses in fiction a lot of people would think that it was through comic books but not quite because a lot of that multiversal stuff had had more or less been killed off after after Crisis, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, for right. a while. For a while, <laughs> but I. But if you were to play, but if I, if someone were to play word association when it comes to my first introduction to multiverse, um, I'd I'd have to respond with sliders, which yeah. I am fully aware is a deep cut, and there and. To a lesser extent, seeing reruns of the original Quantum Leap, which right, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is, I realize that I realize that is before my time, but um, I, but again, I am the guy who would go into a library and just not leave. <laughs> so, right, what counts as before or or my time or not is debatable. But 
in a lot of multiverse um, settings and the like, the better designed ones usually uh, usually have a specific set of rules that um, traveling between universes has. It's the same thing with time travel or any other high concept idea that you'd see in science fiction. With Be with um, the Beza multiverse as you have as you have planned for it, what would you say are some of the rules that ha that have to be um, consistent within it? Well, the, the primary reason that we have the multiverse is there's this cosmic web, which is portals that link between the different worlds. And there's, you know, you get your, your main world, what we call our prime worlds. Mm -hmm. And then you have inner worlds, you have outer worlds, you have beyonders, which are more weird. And we have parallel worlds. So it's, it's an infinite number of worlds. But the primary worlds uh, are the main four. And those are where the linkages will occur in this cosmic web but mm -hmm. to use these linkages you have to be able to access the gates and these are what are called typically people that have access to these powers are known as keys or skeleton keys keys are, are kind of attuned to a single gate mm -hmm. where skeleton keys can be attuned to any gate so that is the the premise that we've set up is that there are special types of people that can allow transfer between the multiverses now that said mm -hmm. that's just in the cosmology we have yeah there's other mechanistic ways that you can do it if you didn't want to follow that cosmology one of them kind of goes back to uh, the influence that i brought in from amber uh, mm -hmm. by roger zelazny which the amber dices role-playing game my favorite game but it came from the the amber stories themselves about walking through uh, dimensions between one another so you're gradually making changes to the sky to the environment to what's happening and so you're transitioning between dimensions by making a bunch of small changes which in the end add up to a, some big changes and so we call that dimension walking mm -hmm. uh, or dimension walk in Bessem and so that's another way that a character who has dimension walk might not be able to access the gates but they would have a special ability that allows them to transition between dimensions through dimension walking so those are typically the the I guess the rules that we set up within the the structure of the best of multiverses there are specific gateways and not every world links to every other world there are specific channels so you can't just go from from any two you have to have particular channels to go through them mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's what make that would make a skeleton key uh, more valuable because of the fact that they can go, that they can go just about anywhere. Yeah, precisely. They are extremely prized uh, to have skeleton keys. Uh, you know, they are kind of wanted. Uh, the people that are skeleton keys, it's a very special place within the multiverse, and there's not a lot of them out there. Uh, and they are, you know, it's kind of like the, the, the chosen person concept is, is common in many different uh, forms of fiction, is these are the chosen people of the cosmic web that can unlock any gates. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing the way you have the gates um, set up, it's a um, it's a one it's a one or a two way road. Yeah, they would all be be two way. Effectively, you know, if you can open the gate, then you can go between. Let's just say uh, Icarus and and Bazaroth as an example. And if you can go between those two, then you can go either way. It would be a single gate, uh, which would be you know maybe have a name to it if you wanted to to get into the mythology of that. You can name a gate, uh, and it would be a, the, really it's the way line. There's really two gates, one in each of the worlds, and then the way line is what connects the two gates. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you mentioned that the, you mentioned different ty different types of worlds, whether they be the core worlds or the or the ones that go that go further out. Um, but let's but I'd like to focus primarily on the four core ones that you mentioned, and that and then expand to some of the other potential types. Sure. So there's yeah. So there's the the four which are the prime worlds which are the six prime worlds and if you include earth earth is effectively a prime world but kind of has a, a special status as a prime world uh called them follows is, is the name of earth but there are six prime worlds in six different genres and they are uh, they sit on a kind of a prime council think of it like the uh the membari gray council from babylon fire that was kind of the inspiration for it where they meet in a special chamber off of earth to discuss policy and whatnot uh and those are the, the primary worlds so the prime worlds is what they're called and then each prime world although they're connected to other prime worlds are also connected to inner worlds which are kind of one step removed and so they have influence and power they're quite 
uh, important in the multiverse, but they're one step removed for prime worlds. And then going one step out from the inner worlds, you get to the outer worlds. And that's when it's getting kind of on the peripheral of what's happening in the outer worlds. And I, I believe there's 42 outer worlds uh, mm -hmm. that we have uh, set up. And we don't define them all because this is, uh, you know, for players and GMs to kind of put their own stamp on the multiverse. Yes, we have our core prime six, but by the time you get to the to the outer worlds, you're kind of defining them that you want. And then outside that, when you're thinking of you getting to really weird ones, then, then then you got your beyonders, which are kind of your infinite realms that anything that you can think of that you'd want to have for a dimension, you can have it with the beyonders. And the, the final one that we actually was new to the Best of Multiverse book that wasn't presented earlier, it's something that we decided was a good addition. And this is what we call the parallel worlds. So these are to deal with the parallel Earths, because we know in anime, there are so many animes that are set on Earth, but not quite Earth, like almost Earth. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're a little bit in the future, maybe they're a little bit in the past. And rather than trying to have these as kind of variations of actual Earth, it made more sense for us to best represent anime by having them being an alternate Earth, which we have as a book well, called Parallel Worlds. So that way, if you wanted to take some of the, the old, an old second edition Bessem book called Centauri Nights, which is set, you know, a couple hundred years in the future, where the UN goes and explores the galaxy, well, this can it started as our earth it's not as if there's magical girls and demons running around it is earth but it's in the future but to have this we just set it up as a as a parallel world uh, off of the the core earth in you know, that we're used to mm -hmm. and we found that adding this extra kind of category of worlds allowed us to explore a lot of options and so everything tied in there isn't anything that can't be part of the best of multiverse with these different uh, categories of worlds that we've come up with. Mm -hmm. Now, taking that into account, taking that into account, like it's when it comes to the six core worlds, I'd like to go through the names of them and just get a just get a skinny as to what one would expect in those worlds. I'm obviously ignoring um, Omphalos for the purposes of this. Right, sure, yeah. So we so, don't need to talk about Earth. We know what Earth is. Yeah, uh, and the way we set up in particular with the multiverse was they are worlds but really the they're expressions of genres and that's why we we made them a prime world so aradia for example this is kind of romantic fantasy so think of something that would be a lot of uh not angels as in religious angels, but you know, winged beings. This is a place where the planet is living. Uh, everyone is, is uh, very in tune with nature. And so this is a, what we call a romantic fantasy genre, which has a world called Alradia. In mm -hmm. kind of the counter to that one, the next one is Bazar Batheroth. And Bazaroth is the demonic horror genre. Mm -hmm. So this is a world where there's a lot of uh, subjugation, a lot of people, you know, yes, if you're on the top, if you're like the, the, the top level arch fiends ruling over great domains in a demonic hellscape, yeah, you got a lot of power, but there's obviously going to be lots of people that don't have that. And so you can have it, uh, the genre being very low level or very high level depending on kind of where you're playing. You can play it on a on a political scale where you're you're amongst the most important movers and shakers on Bazaroth, or you are peons and, and you have a lot of oppression because you're living in you know, a pretty crappy place. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's Bazaroth. Uh, then we move on to Cathedral. This is their traditional space fantasy or space mm -hmm. opera. So think of, you, you, you can go with a, a non-anime reference like Firefly, or maybe you go with Cowboy Bebop for a more anime style and that's what really this is it's kind of a mixture it's closer to uh low level technology it, it's not the star trek it's more the star wars mm -hmm. where everything's not polished and and all glitzing but there's there's a little bit of grind to it that's why it's it's space opera uh, mm -hmm. then we move on to enid which is an interesting one this is a a world that was affected by heavy weather devastation so there has been have been um, post apocalyptic aspects. So kind of think Mad Max aspects, mm -hmm. but this is one where there are warring factions and. Uh, some people live uh, underground, some people live in domes, and of course what's really interesting in these is this is where the mecha come in, that the, there is a lot of mecha that are run by uh, 
people, that it's uh, almost like the Evangelion style mecha, where it's not someone piloting it with like a joystick, but they're using their mind, they're using their essence. And there are factions that do this voluntarily, and then there's other, which we call psycho slaves, and these are people that are basically plugged into mecha to function, but they're not really there voluntarily uh, to do that. And so there's the the eternal war that goes on between the different factions while they're living on a, on a world that's been devastated by heavy weather events. Uh, think of the worst of, of climate change, and that's what Enid is, uh, or Enid. Then we have uh, Icarus, and Icarus is our traditional sword and sorcery fantasy with the one change is that unlike a lot of kind of traditional fantasy that's being run by like the kings and the queens and the people with the swords uh, Icarus is more ruled by people with the magic so it's not to say that it's only mages that's it's not what the world is but it's uh, a high influence of people that have magical ability and and the power of of magic is given more weight than the power of a sword uh, mm-hmm. and that's uh, Icarus and then the uh, final one is Imago and Imago is what we call kind of reality punk this is the the bread and circuses think um, take our world as an example and you know all the stuff that's going on with the UFC and uh, all these extreme sports and the whole world is set up to it's got rid of of all governments and corporations run everything. This is a, a mega core world, a one world government run by corporations, but they're keeping everyone placated and entertained through nonstop entertainment. Mm-hmm. And this is this reality punk. It's it's high level, but it's all about extracting the most amount of entertainment out of things. Now, interesting with something like this, we have you know the governments run universal basic income programs, and so everyone's taken care of, but not to a degree that would be uh, maybe helpful or everyone's happy. So there's maybe some aspects of the the Expanse uh, TV show or, or the novel series that they have their their basic, although this was you know conceived of prior to the Expanse. But the idea of governments running everything ra- or, or corporations running everything rather than governments, and so that's what uh, Imago is. And those are kind of the the different genres that we have in the expression of a genre. We give it the context by creating a world around it. Mm-hmm. Now, since since you mentioned a few a few anime that could be that could be analogs, um, with with each of with each of them, I'm cur- I'm curious I'm curious what other anime might be might be analogous to the to the um, prime worlds. Yeah, so not obviously not everything would have a kind of a, an analogy. It's more, I guess, what I would consider almost inspiration. I guess. I guess th- uh, this is it, a roundabout way for me for me to ask about what would be their respective appendix N. Right. <laughs> um, so if I was to say, let's go, let's go to Aradia, kind of with the uh, the romantic fantasy. So there's aspects of uh, Oh My Goddess, Tenchi Muyo, uh, Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Services, um, mm-hmm. kind of Wedding Wedding Peach, uh, but also aspects if you go outside of anime, because of course, while we, this is an anime game as Bessem, it's also going to bring an inspiration from say stuff like Romeo and Juliet, uh, The Last Herald Mage, even um, you know Once Upon a time and sensate uh, would be uh, you know modern TV shows that would also have inspiration on there. So that would kind of be what I'd consider romantic fantasy. Certainly, from a novel point of view, the Mercedes Lackey's novels with the uh, the Last Herald Mage fits in very well with there. Um, so that would that would probably what I'd consider for that. I mean, Bazaroth, I mean, when you bring in horrific fantasy you're going from the old school demon city shinjuku and vampire hunter d um you can go a little bit more modern tokyo ghoul for example uh, maybe you go haka show mm-hmm. um but there's also going to be aspects as i mentioned about um you know some more modern stuff that's not anime like preacher you know the tv show and, and the mm-hmm. comic uh the chronicles of amber in in the sense of they have the, the courts of chaos and that's and then you got like the, the prophecy and constantine these are things that deal with yeah. demons but it's maybe would still feature humans for example um that's kind of what i recommend for that for uh cathedral obviously as i mentioned kind of one of the big ones is is cowboy bebop that Mm -hmm. most people would recognize as the anime reference but everything from outlaw star uh, captain harlock spaceship 
um, a space battleship uh, Yamato. You've got um, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, but also uh, the Expanse and Dune and Foundation, Firefly, Babylon Five. I mean, in fact, on Cathedral, while it is a planet that you know, think of it, you can think of like the Tatooine style planet with a lot of desert. But there was a space station that you know where a lot of business gets done, and this is mm-hmm. business with a bunch of different races coming together. So right off the bat, you're kind of in Babylon Five territory as as well there. So yeah. that would I certainly think would would play out well with the the space opera aspects of Cathedral. Mm-hmm. Uh, Enid is interesting because it's not as common uh, a genre that kind of a heavy weather devastation. As I mentioned, obviously Total Recall or or sort of Mad Max Total Recall are kind of the live action ones, but also you know Evangelion because of the the, the mech aspects and Mobile Suit Gundam, uh, Code Geass uh, certainly would play in there. But you're also going to have some uh, some video game like Metal Gear Solid and Super Robot Wars would certainly be video games that would have some references to that as well and i think that would be mm-hmm. uh kind of an appropriate way to look at it yeah uh for for a car that's that's going to be the easiest one for people to come up with examples from anime i mean just think of you got your fairy tale black clover real lotus war sword art online slayers um you know even that time i got reincarnated as a slime those all play in there but don't forget yeah the you know, lord of the rings harry potter and dark crystal and crawl i mean those are all great inspirations as well that play into that because there's such a flexibility within high fantasy that people would be used to uh and then uh for imago i would say some of the inspiration from an anime point of view obviously pokemon we, we have the <laughs> equivalent of neomorphs uh there so all the, the the pet monster battle stuff but also you know bubblegum crisis ghost in the shell um maybe pat labor uh certainly would be their astro boy these are aspects of kind of a a, a future that has technology but also government uh, influence and how that plays out but in terms of live action you know blade runner Hunger Games, Tron, RoboCop. Those, I mean, just RoboCop is a great example where governments and corporations, they kind of start blending together. So, yeah, th- those are a lot of inspirations. We do include kind of lists of those in um, the multiverse book just to give people an idea of kind of the some of the ideas of where we're coming from with some of those aspects. Mm-hmm. Now, taking that taking that into, uh, into account... Oh. I will I will admit when when I when I looked through when I looked through just some of the stuff with or with um a few with a few of the nation a few of the worlds mm-hmm. um especially especially stuff like I- stuff like Icarus um as somebody who's trying to, who encourages people to look outside of um what's can, what's expected when it comes to fantasy you, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody would use a Karis to do a, um, to do a, a Legend of Arslan influenced campaign. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly it certainly plays in there. I mean, the, the cosmology, I guess, we set up with the world isn't going to map onto anything perfectly but no. certainly a lot of inspiration and they can take aspects from you know one show or another take aspects from the book and kind of create their own version of it you know we're kind of providing a, a rough template and the nature of Bessem, which has always been you know we leave we, we give you a, a toolkit and then we leave the creation to you i mean that's been from from the rule structure but it's also from how we do a setting where we're not giving you the minutia on every single thing that gives you no room to create on your own we give you the framework we give you enough detail that is complete and it seems whole and living but there's lots of places for you to insert your own material as well and your own influences yeah, and with the, with that kind of thing in mind, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to each of when it comes to each of them, I of course do do see that that there is there is a there's a fair few te- a fair few templates and and the like some play, uh, player facing material. Um, how easier dif- how easier difficult would it be to integrate some of the stuff that's present here with what was present in um extras oh not not at all certainly this is intended to be used with extras if that is kind of what you would like from the different rules point i mean a lot of the the aspect of extras was optional and um 
got expanded rule systems. So you can use anything from extras and use that in multiverse if you want. A lot of that is is going to play off fine and not have any problems with it. At yeah. the same time, you don't need extras to use multiverse. We don't want to create, and this is very important when I'm looking at the structure of how to create an RPG line. Mm -hmm. What I don't want is a lot of uh, vertical requirements so i don't want you have to have, yeah obviously you have to have the core book is kind of the top of the vertical but then below the core book i want as much to be horizontal as possible so i don't want there to be you need the core book and then underneath that you need book a and then underneath that you need book one and then after need book b book asterisks i don't want that kind of uh, deep dive i want you to be able to use all these books equally and in conjunction as long as you have the core rules mm-hmm and with that, with that in mind, I know I said I was I wasn't going to delve into Omphalos too much in the, in that set of examples, but there's a few elements that are shown on the table of contents that I did want to dip into a little bit. Mm -hmm. The first of which being what the Iron Arm Society is and what their goals are. Yeah. So the, I mean, I guess they're they're a. Um, kind of a, a group where are big on martial arts. I mean, mm -hmm. The Iron Arm Society kind of sounds martial artsy, uh, and though so they channel all their life force and their and their key energy into being martial warriors, almost like um, Knight Templars that you you'd think of that. But there'd be like the it's it's a non-religiously affiliated. These are cosmologically affiliated mm -hmm. and so uh, what their goal is is to kind of protect earth uh on follows but also they they host a every 10 years they host an iron arm tournament which gets all the greatest warriors together uh, and you know so there there's other aspects of them but we give kind of a, a brief framework, uh, you know, uh, several paragraphs of what this Iron Arm Society is to give you ideas on something that you may want to riff off that and, and do it on your own campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, now speaking speaking of that, the other one, the other faction I wanted to ask about was the Psychic Action Corps. I would it be fair of me to say that they're akin to a psychic um, police, so, sort of like the Psychor in Judge Dread or even some, even some of the more paranormal police kind of motifs, like in Silent Mobius. Yeah, in some ways, but they're more concerned. The Psychic Action Corps are more concerned with um, external threats. So the people in the Psychic Action Corps know about the multiverse, and the average person doesn't. Like the like you and me, and the average person on any world doesn't understand that there is a multiverse. But the Psychic Action Corps, they're looking for. Uh, influence from the other worlds onto Omphalos and how to deal with that. And so that's really, it, it came up whenever I was doing way back uh, when I was first doing the, the core book is one of the play test adventures I came up for fourth edition involved this fictional group that I called the Psychic Action Corps and everyone was part of it. It's a great way to to get people involved. Think of it almost, um, I mean, if, if you know the, the, movie demon city shinjuku mm -hmm. where there's these kind of like these these groups of people or maybe a uh, wicked city uh where there's this group of people that know what's going on and it's their kind of goal to keep balance and protect the earth and that's kind of what the the, the pack is known for mm -hmm. i'm pr i'm pretty sure that so that somebody could also make a parallel between this and men in black as well Oh yeah, that, that's a that's a great example. I should have thought of that one. I mean, obviously, it's we're not dealing with aliens, so to speak, but people from other dimensions. But Men in Black is is a really probably a good way to to bring up the the overall feel. It's not the exact same execution, but it's kind of the feel for it. It's this uh, secret society that is there to protect Omphalos against external threats, which sounds a lot like the Men in Black. Mm -hmm. So that that and. <laughs> that and, and the rules when it comes to secrecy. I mean, we all everybody knows about the neuralizer and why it, why it, why it's um, why it, why it, why it's not why um, under why understanding extraterrestrial life in that story is a dangerous thing and why it can be just as dangerous for regular humans to know that kind of thing. Right, and and maybe not the quite. The, the same uh, idea comes behind this. I mean, if someone on Earth finds out that, that 
demons are real and they come from Batheroth. I mean, a lot of that plays out with even what's you know currently on Netflix, uh, you know, Warrior Nun, uh, mm-hmm. based on Ben's Dunn comics, or anything where you have this uh, society that learns about other people from other dimensions, whether they're angels or demons or or whatever it is, two dimensional beings. Um, it's not always dangerous to them to do that unless they find out a secret and the other people are trying to hump them down, and you know, then you get them to the 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 global multiverse battles. Mm-hmm. Oh. And truth, truth be told, I'm no, str- I'm no stranger to to the concept of a se- of a secret organization um, protecting humanity from from the shadows. Hell, we did we did an entire stream coming up with that kind of thing where we developed the symposium of life um, experiment, which is kind of going on a, on a sim- on a similar motif, just mm-hmm. with just with um, dealing with that dealing with extra dimensional threats that try to encroach instead instead of a multiverse right and and the great thing about organizations like that from a, a player character point of view it's a great way to to bring all the characters together i mean you D D your standard adventuring party and you don't always have a reason why you just like get together in an inn and decide to adventure together well this gives people a reason that you're all part of the same organization for mm-hmm. example and so you know there's something else going on and so it gives you kind of that that central focus and then they could expand out from there i mean if someone is part of the psychic action core there's it's completely reasonable to think that one once you're dealing with what's going on on and follows, maybe it, you find a way to travel to another uh, dimension. And if you can find your way through one of the way lines, maybe you'll end up on another um, another one of the prime worlds. And you can continue being the the psychic action core representatives on this other dimension. It, it's it's fantastic the what these organizations can do from a role playing group because it gives you that that cohesive focus. Yeah, but. With now, with that in with that in mind, I'd like to shift a little bit into the other major thing, and that is the grand return of Eurasia, Grave of Heaven. Yeah, that was a. Uh, it's it's really nice to have Eurasia coming back. This is something that. Uh, back in second edition Bessem that S. John Ross kind of uh, approached uh, our company and said, hey, you know, I want to do this thing. And and at that point, we had a little bit looser structure for how we did expansions. And so we kind of let him run with it at that point. And we did a second edition book and, and we were happy with it and the fans were happy with it. And then, of course, the company went under. And when that happened, um, you know, we still owed, owed some money to S. John that we couldn't pay because the company was insolvent. And so in payment we gave him back Eurasia and then over the past you know, almost 20 years as John has been building upon Eurasia and, and expanding it out with uh, stuff little, you know, little expansions whether it's maps a little bit of ventures now all of this was system agnostic that he was doing like we had the Bessem version and he took out all of the Bessem rules and just made it a fantasy world and he's worked on it as it's been a passion um and there was an opportunity uh, last year that we had approached him and said, hey, you know, we are looking to expand our Bessem line and it would be great to have Eurasia back, even though it's currently system agnostic. Why don't we, if we, we purchase it from you, we'll put the Bessem back into Eurasia uh, in a fourth edition and we'll do a compilation of every, almost everything in those 20 years that he's worked on into a single book. And so while the original Eurasia was, uh, I think, a 112 or 96 page digest size book that we did for Bessem Second Edition, this is 224 pages full size, hardcover, full color, uh, because there was a lot of extra material he wrote. Mm. In addition, we actually had S. John, after we, we purchased it, we realized, well, that you know, there's just one extra chapter we could use. Uh, can we get you to, to write a, a, a brand new section, which was which a nice little addition. So even for the longtime Eurasia fans, there's going to be something new mm-hmm. that they hadn't seen before because no one has seen it yet. And so this, this book, the Eurasia, it's the setting that he created. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I added in the Besom rules uh, into fourth edition and added templates and uh, statted out items and whatnot. But also, we we inserted Eurasia into the Besom multiverse, not not the book, the Besom multiverse, but mm -hmm. the anime multiverse structure that we had set up. And we've established where it is, and that there's a way line off of Icarus, which is the high fantasy world that leads out to Eurasia. So Eurasia is one of the inner worlds that we have set up, and there's twelve inner worlds. Eurasia is one of them, and this was a great way to bring back something from best and second edition that we were passionate about at the time as john has been passionate for almost 20 years working on this and now we're bringing it back into the best and fold to to be a setting book and so launching that book with the best multiverse kickstarter just made sense because it is a setting this is like the setting kickstarter so of the four products, they're all related to the setting and having this as a very, very detailed world. Like, interestingly, both the Bessa multiverse, which covers the entire multiverse, and Eurasia, which covers one single world, they're the same size, 224 pages, which goes and shows you the amount of detail that goes into this one single world. And it's a great... Um, almost like a study on how a world can be created that's not done in the traditional say D, D style with water deep or gray hawk where it goes into like a super amount of mechanical crunch details but this goes into a lot of story detail and um so much irreverent uh writing that he's done over the this time we're just thrilled to have it compiled into a really uh gorgeous book mm -hmm. and I realize that for a lot of people, this is going to be their first introduction to Eurasia. Given that, what's the elevator pitch that you tend to give people as far as what sort of setting it is? Yeah, well, I mean, the easiest way, I mean, is the pitch I use that it's irrever irreverent anime fantasy. And mm -hmm. so um, it's it doesn't take itself too seriously. There are, you know, gods of cookery that... Um, that that they receive the highest level of standing because they're great cooks and there's they have god of cookery battles almost think iron chef you know from japan uh but to you know slimes which uh, while we have slimes in besom the first time uh, slimes ever appeared uh, in the besom line was in the eurasia expansion for besom second edition and we liked it so much and obviously we know it's it's the, kind of the origins in video games, but we incorporated them into the core besom. But Eurasia has so much more about slimes <laughs> that go into that. Um, there's all sorts of stuff about uh, you know princesses that are escaping and riding on pirate ships, and um, in these these magnificent. Um, groups of dwarves, which are called the Charcoal Kings, which they have these great powers uh, that they can tap into and turn uh, into into smoke. Um, there are just some beautiful small small hamlets with you know a few buildings and the amount of detail that can go into the people living there um there is a a, a minotaur that is kind of like a almost like a robin hood that protects his city and he dresses up as as the 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 white swan and uh goes and protects his his uh the area um it's really by calling it irreverent fantasy, it, it's not your traditional D&D &D fantasy. This is intended to be a little on the silly side, a little on the fun side, uh, but it's designed to really bring out characters rather than than mechanics. Yeah. And with that in, with that in with that in mind, uh, most of the most of the um, races that are within that are within it are going to be what people would usually expect, but there is there are certainly some unorthodox ones. Um, I think I think one of the ones that people are going to immediately notice, especially since it's on the prototype cover, is the is the mushroom. Yeah, the <laughs> mushroom, mushroom troll. troll. Uh yeah, I mean they're they're not actually trolls, but everyone calls them mushroom trolls. Um, yeah, the 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 morpha, and these are interesting mushroom people uh, yeah. that live. Um, but yeah, we have you can play a snowman. Mm -hmm. uh, like these are living snowmen that the kind of children create them and and inadvertently imbue them with life magic. And so yeah, you can play a snowman if you want. Uh, but there, there's all the uh, traditionals, you know, the elves and the dwarves and the humans and centaurs. Mm -hmm. But these are are variations of them. They, these yeah. aren't your D and D dwarves and your D and D elves. Although, although um, I've 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 had a 
within the temple, we have a we've had we have a joke that we've had for a while when it comes to um, dwarves. Why do why do dwarves wield axes when they live underground? Why is that? Because elves live in trees. <laughs> okay, that's a good way to do it. <laughs> oh. Although I I get the feeling that Lodos elves would be more accurate than D and D elves, even though yeah, <laughs> certainly yeah, yeah even yeah. though Lodos you know inspired by D and D directly um, yeah yeah with with, with Eurasia, it is you know it's called the Grave of Heaven as a subtitle because mm -hmm. this is um, like the, the heaven fell a, a long time ago and kind of destroyed the world and mm -hmm. it is now this fragmentation of islands where the further you move away from your core islands uh things start getting weird and you 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 get pulled back you keep wanting to return and on the outskirts of these island ranges there that's where the trolls live the trolls as being a term that they call them but they're like Kind of like your your beast creatures, I, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, but this is, you know, the, the gods have have left and had this giant war, and heaven fell onto the planet and kind of destroyed the world. Uh, and it, you know, humanity had to pick itself up up after a cataclysm, and that's kind of where Eurasia picks up. Yeah. In that regard, would it be fair of me to say that it is a post post apocalypse? Yeah, that's a post book. That that's really great. You're not dealing with the apocalyptic fallout. Is you know they've lived with it for a while now, and they've they've come back. But uh, yeah, the apocalypse happened in the past. This isn't you know a, a linear world where it has gone on for thousands and thousands of years without any problems. So, you know in not living memory, but certainly uh, at least not for most people, but there was a time where not too long ago, there was the apocalypse but they've moved beyond the uh, the, the survival and you know, I have to you know, do anything you can to get food because you know the, the apocalypse just happened. No, it didn't just happen but uh, post post is a great way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the I use that line to describe um settings where the apoc the apocalypse has happened, the bombs be have been dropped, and all that, but so much time has passed that you have new cultures starting to, t either starting to take shape, or they already have taken shape. Yeah, that's that's a good way to do it. I mean, it, it, a lot of the, the, you know, you're thinking of your, the, the movies and TV shows where you'd have you know, the, the the lost technology, the you know the people remember when it used to be something, um, and it's kind of like like that. That it's it's not it wasn't high tech. It wasn't like uh, you're going from Star Trek and then suddenly there's an apocalypse. It wasn't. It's not that type of science fiction. It is fantasy still, but mm -hmm. yeah, post post is a good way to put it. Yeah, I su I suppose I suppose another analogy I could use is that of trinity blood since that is technically a post-apocalypse uh yeah i mean yeah it certainly would, would fit the bill enough yeah absolutely i mean am i kind of cheating with that with that yes i am <laughs> but it's not cheating if you do the math yeah i, I kind of don't i mean i i don't really feel that there's anything that I can draw, uh, you know, a, a direct line from Eurasia to X. Uh, I mean, certainly uh, in the book, S. John, uh, in the part which we republished, uh, kind of talks about his inspirations for it. And, he, and you, you definitely see inspirations on when you're reading through. It's like, oh, I, I can definitely see that. But just reading through it, it, it seems so unlike any other fantasy rpg expansion that i've ever come across uh i think it's it's an incredibly unique placement within um the rpg industry mm -hmm. now i did see that that one of the things you have you have on the on the um, package is maps but there's not a, i there's not a whole lot for me to say when it comes to that because well they're maps <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. That was just going along with the idea of the four products. That, that this is, you know, product number three, which is related to the the setting, because these are the maps of the six prime worlds that are in the best of multiverse. And yes, the maps are printed in the book, but and we, originally the the map pack was not part of the plan. We were mm -hmm. just 
contracting maps to put in the into the book and then when i saw that i'm like you know people might want to hang these on their wall or place it on the table during the play like these are gorgeous why would we just limit it to being a small size map and we had them at a sufficiently high resolution that we could actually make wall maps uh, for people to have and so releasing a, a a map pack is not something we've done before uh well i mean certainly discami hasn't but even in guardians of order never released maps uh, mm -hmm. as a package we might include a map in in some of the books we did um we did a, a couple of books where we included a map but this is a new product uh for us and i i'm really excited about it. i think it's it's going to be uh very popular mm -hmm. and but one of the other, one of the things i definitely found interesting that's being that's being added to the list is ikarion gate the to my knowledge um neither neither the old company or 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 Discami ever ever did full-on novels no i mean when we were at uh you know guardians of order we did an anthology for silver age sentinels a superhero anthology but we never did novel publishing it just wasn't something that was kind of in the line of of our our product offerings and with this one in particular is there ethan freckleton is the author he approached us a couple of years ago and said hey you know just wondering if you might have any interest in having a novel and have you considered uh maybe doing uh, a lit rpg given that it's you know we can set it within the besom world which was actually very interesting at the time because i was going on a bender of lit rpg i had never heard of them before and then i stumbled across uh, an audiobook and i i just do audiobooks now i kind of mm -hmm. uh, i fall asleep when i read uh so i try to do all my my novels through audiobooks and i was just absorbing as much as i could i mean audible's fantastic for getting a bunch of audiobooks and i love the the lit rpg genre i had yeah. never heard of it and it had it threw me back to being a kid and watching say like the last starfighter or tron these aspects where they seem to be games but real world at the same time and lit rpgs are uh, a way for people to take a usually fantasy but but not exclusively but often fantasy type of book and then have it the characters in the novel have game stats not a character sheet like you'd think they're not playing a game um but they have stats in the game almost like uh, say sword art online is probably the most modern anime one that i can think of where these characters who go into an uh, to world they're just playing a game yeah. but lit rpg is usually the people aren't playing a game they're in a game and yet they have game stats and they know they're in a game or have a, in a game interface and so they're you know, trying to level up, gain powers or whatnot, and and the progression of a lit RPG is it the characters grow in a game mechanic sense as they go. So if you defeat uh, monsters or you do a quest, you might get some experience points, which gives you maybe a level up or a new power. Obviously, Bassem doesn't have levels, <laughs> and so what we decided to do, working with Ethan, is to bring in the characters within the setup that we have for the Bessem Multiverse, have a novel set within there, but have the characters having Bessem stats. They don't they're not they don't, they don't know their Bessem stats, but we're using kind of a foundation our game but presenting it in a novel sense. So if you don't know anything about Bassem, you, you don't lose anything. It's just there's the same way you can pick up any lit RPG and and read it and enjoy it for what it is. But if you know Bassem, you'll see that the stats that the characters have in the game, that they're related to what we are doing with our Bassem game. Mm -hmm. And since you, met, since you mentioned doing stuff with Audible, you'd probably get a kick out of um, graphic audio if you've, heard, if you've ever heard of them. Yeah, I mean, I've I've watched some um, of those. It's it doesn't appeal to me as much. Uh, it's not to me. It's not as portable as like an audiobook where I can you know read while I'm driving, so to speak. Uh, uh, but I, I know I know the graphic audio are are, are popular. Um, <laughs> I I think you I think you're thinking of um, of motion comics. Um, graphic audio is a it is. It's akin to an audiobook, but it's more like a radio drama than an audiobook. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry, I was misinterpreting. Yeah, um, they've. I first found out about them through their take on the Stormlight Archive, which was at, which is absolutely phenomenal, and I want whatever drugs Brandon Sanderson is on. Um, <laughs> he probably he probably isn't on any. He's just a he's just a worse workaholic than either of us. <laughs> yeah, he is. 
but when it came, when it comes to the since you mentioned go, going on a kick of lit RPGs, um, what what particular one put you put you down the put you down the path of that rabbit hole, or did it just happen one day? Well, the first one I got introduced to was The Land uh, by Alaron Kong, which mm-hmm. is you know, somewhat controversial within the the lit RPG community for its status but you know it's no no one can deny its uh impact and its sales that it's had through audible and the land was was a really fun um kind of silly you know the, maybe low brow humor in some ways but it was it was interesting that you know a character dies then they wake up in a fantasy world and they have these game stats and they know that they're game stats that they have but they're they're dead and again when i go back to uh, say something like an anime show like that time i got reincarnated as a slime uh, as an example not quite lit rpg first of all it's anime not not literature but uh you know here's a character who's in earth he dies he gets reincarnated in a fantasy world of slime and he gains powers now it's not quite the the rpg aspect but it uh, certainly played out very similarly to a lot of the lit RPGs. And mm-hmm. you know, once I started reading The Land and was really enjoying that, then I started getting into ones that are a little less fantasy or maybe more adjacent. And there's some just fantastic series out there, whether Dungeon Crawler Carl, which is you know spectacularly good. Uh, you have He Who Fights with Monsters, which is great. And then... I ran into one that is certainly still a lit RPG, but is is maybe a little different. That's called Creatures in Caverns. Um, and this is one where the audiobook was done by someone named Jonathan Sleep. And this is almost like like they're playing a game called Creatures in Caverns and they, they actually get sucked into the world. It's D&D is what it is, Dungeons and Dragons. And they all have these Dungeons and Dragons characters and levels. And this is, is something that... I thought Jonathan Sleep was hilarious and did a really great job with the audiobook. And so whenever we were going to do an audiobook, once you know, if we're gonna do a novel, why not do an audiobook? Because that's what I really enjoy. I reached out to Jonathan Sleep and we actually came to an agreement. And so he's doing the audiobook narration and he's done mm-hmm. You know, the creatures in caverns, which is you know very funny, very, uh, very naughty, uh, but an incredibly funny, and uh, you know lots of, you know the the dick and fart jokes type aspect, but really really well done, and so he was a great fit for what we were doing with uh, Ikari and Gate. Mm-hmm. And as a, from what I under from what I understand, you plan on that being the first book in a trilogy. <laughs> Yeah, whenever Ethan uh, kind of approached us, it was, well, we could either do a, you know, a single novel or do a trilogy. And I thought, well, I know fantasy. I mean, I, I'm a, a voracious reader and you know, I'm, I'm not looking at like a 14-volume a Wheel of Time type aspect, nor do I want a, a five-volume and 15 years in between the next volume George Martin type situation. Uh, but I thought, if we're going to do it, like when I when I was growing up with D&D, uh, you know, the, the Forgotten Realms trilogies, all of these were trilogies and they were really fun that D&D did these trilogy books. So I thought, well, why don't we do a trilogy of of a lit RPG. It'll give you a chance to flesh out the world a little bit more. And uh, yeah, so we we decided, yeah, let, let's get it done. So Akarian Gate is, it's called the Akarian series is what it is. Akarian for people that know, and just a bit of a tangent. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is set in the best of multiverse and we established right in the core book back in in third edition when we talked about the multiverse as one of the kernels of inspiration right off the bat in um the world of uh imago which we mentioned was the kind of the bread and circuses and this is the entertainment aspect uh the entertainment world one of the big things that they have is this online you know multiplayer rpg type stuff and ikarian is the name of the gate or the name of the game is you're playing ikarian but one of the things that that with the multiverses there's actually a way gate a, a, a way line that is within 
the online role-playing game on this high-tech world that leads into the actual fantasy world of uh, 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 Icarus. Mm. And so Icarion is the name of the MMORPG that you can play online, and it's like very a virtual reality game, but some people accidentally get sucked into the real fantasy world of Icarion. And mm. that concept, it, it's it's not unlike um you know maybe some some other lit rpg references but it was something that was it's tron i mean think of it like mm -hmm. tron where you're playing a video game you get sucked into the video game where here's people that you're you're playing an online game and you're strapped in with a virtual headset and then suddenly you ended up getting somehow transported over to a real world and so that kind of fish out of the water idea that's where we came up with the the, the setting for Akarian. it just made sense to have a Karian gate play within this lit rpg aspect of why do these why do, is it a lit rpg is because the people were playing a video game mm -hmm. uh you know a virtual reality video game in this high-tech reality world or the high-tech world of imago and they ended up going through Ikarian Gate, and that's how they're interacting with um, uh, Ikarus. So that's not really giving away the plot of the novel. That's you know from Bessem. Anyone that knows you know the word Ikarian, it, it'll tell you exactly what's kind of the, the premise of what's happening with the novels. Um, but it's a, a really fun thing to do, and we're looking forward to that trilogy. This is book one, and if everything goes well, so book two is underway, and we're going to have it finished early next year. Obviously, we have to edit and lay it out and get the audiobook done and then mm -hmm. there's book three and then then it's done at that point that the trilogy is done it's just something new for us we've never done novels uh, we've never done audiobooks it's not our main line and we're not we're not set up as a major book publisher we're a hobby game publisher and so um this isn't going to be quite the the same setup as uh, uh you know a regular novel series but we think it's it's a fun way to support the best in line mm-hmm and I will certainly be looking forward to see, to seeing how this kind of thing how this kind of thing develops. Um, with now, what are you shooting for for as far as a release window for the PDF versions of of some of the stuff we've covered tonight? So uh, we are. There's a couple pieces of art that are still coming in, um, you know, including the the cover for Akari and Gate. One of the things on the Kickstarter, we actually have a placeholder because the cover wasn't done in time mm -hmm. and so we're you know we expect over the next uh month these these last few pieces of artwork are coming in that all the books are written um uh, you know everything is kind of done except for these last art pieces and so we we are gonna send out the pdfs so the, the kickstarter ends kind of first week uh or so of december and then it always take a week or two to clear through the the kickstarter system and for the money to be sent to us and so we're already near the end of december and so we're just going to be waiting until kind of early mid January and then we'll be sending out the PDFs to everyone at that point um, sending the books off the press again we, we can't send them to press until we have the the art done uh, but they'll be going to press in January as well and while we set a June release date that's given the the, the previous experiences we've recently had with uh, COVID delays, we don't know if there's going to be still these uh, global supply chain issues. So we set the, the the date fairly far in the future. We're hoping that it can be fulfilled before June, given our internal timelines. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, uh, promise and then under deliver. We wanted to kind of go in reverse because we, we've had some problems with our recent Kickstarters, whether it's, um, you know, Anime 5e was really problematic and, you know, less problematic, but still a couple of months off from what we wanted to, absolute power. And we know that the worldwide situation is improving, but at any point, there could be still some shipping problems. So if everything goes according to plan, by June, physical products, January, digital products. Mm hmm. <clears throat> And like I said, I'll be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple once again and enjoy the particular bit of crazy that happens around here. Uh, no, well, well, thank you for the invite. Yeah, every time we uh, we do a Kickstarter, it's always gracious that you invite us out here to, to talk about what we're passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I love what we're doing, and I think we're, we have some uh, amazing products that we're coming out with, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting out there. So thank you for giving us this platform. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Meet Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.